Hello and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to jump into talking about edit mode, which gives you much more freedom in terms of manipulating objects than object mode. Uh, the tools we'll discuss in this video are just an overview, and we'll gradually learn more and more about edit mode throughout our lessons. But after this video, you should be able to do quite a bit. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. If you remember from last video, we start out in Blender and object mode by default, and that's indicated right up here. So to enter object mode, uh, you just select your object. But for this lesson, uh, I think a cube is a little too simplistic. We need something with a little more geometry to work with. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this. And I'm going to go ahead and add the UV sphere. And we're going to work with this. So you just select your object and then hit tab to move into edit mode. And so right off the bat, you should notice uh, quite a difference between this and object mode. Uh, for one, you can see all the edges, and it's kind of hard to see with this highlight, so I'm going to click off of this for a moment. So, yeah. And it should look kind of like a combination of wireframe and solid view. So you've got all your lines visible, but then you can also see all the surfaces that make up your object. And in Blender, uh, an object's underlying structure is called a mesh. And meshes are made up of three different components. So uh, they have points which we call vertices, and they have lines, which we call edges, and then they have surfaces, which we call faces. Scroll down my notes really quick, and by default, edit mode is set up to work with edges, but you can change this behavior, meaning that you can change it to work with points or faces by selecting one, two, or three on your number row, not the number pad. So uh, I just did this a minute ago, but if you hit one on the number row, now you can select individual points or your vertices. If you hit two on the number row, now you can select your lines, or your edges. And if you hit three, now you can select your surfaces or your faces. And uh, there are also buttons for these, which are located right here. So if I hit this first button, now I can select my points. The second button, now I can select my lines or my edges. And the third button, now I can select my surfaces or my faces. And the only reason I really bring that up is uh, in case any of you are using the emulated numpad, I'm not really sure how Blender handles those three options, especially if you've already mapped your numpad. I expect that when you tried to hit one, two, and three, you probably had a lot of view toggling going on, so just in case, uh, there are some buttons available for you. If you notice, there are also a large variety of tools here on the left, and some of these are available in object mode as well, and I'll try to point out which are and which aren't, but there's also a lot of tools which are unique to edit mode as well, so it's worth going over them all. And so the first tool on our list uh, is the selection tool, and this is the tool that Blender starts out with, and by default, it's the select box which means that you draw a box on the screen with left click, so you hold and drag. And when you release, everything that's inside the box gets selected. And so see there, half of that. Uh, and one important thing to note, so if I try to select everything and then rotate around to the back of the object, uh, so this will only select what's visible uh, according to the camera. So if you want to change that, uh, you can go to wireframe mode with Shift Z and now, if I try to select, and I'll go back to solid view just so you can see, uh, look at that, it's selected everything. Beautiful. Okay, and so scrolling down my notes again, uh, if you left click and hold over your selection tool, you'll notice that we get some options. And the first option is the tweak tool. And so this is kind of like a freeform grab. And so I can select like a face and then I can just immediately drag it around and I'll escape out of that. And same thing if you're in edge mode, you can just grab an edge. Or if you're in vertex mode, you can just grab a point. And so you don't have to keep hitting G, G, G to start and end your transformations. And just like uh, with the G, you can also clamp this to axes with X, Y, and Z. And also the shift operations work as well. And you can type in a specific amount like 1. So uh, pretty much everything that works with uh, pressing G also works with that. If you're doing a lot of transformations, and uh, especially if you're trying to like fine-tune a mesh, 
like for instance let's say I wanted to make all these points kind of closer to this one so see now I don't have to keep hitting G to do this I can just drag these around so if you're trying to fine-tune a mesh this can be a really useful uh, tip to know about I'm gonna go ahead and Z out of this put it back the way it was because I need this to be uniform for what we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, okay, and so the next is the circle select. And this is kind of like a paintbrush. So if I click and drag over, and it's kind of hard to see because I have points on, so let me turn on faces. There we go. So anything that this scrolls over gets selected. And another really cool thing you can do with this, uh, if I hold down the left click and then scroll the middle mouse wheel in and out, uh, you can see that circle getting a little bigger. Well, that's the radius for the selection. So now it's kind of like I've got a bigger paintbrush. And so using this little tip, you can uh, really fine-tune how much exactly you're selecting. And then there's one last selection tool I want to talk about, and that's the lasso select. And so it's kind of like a freeform version of the box select. So you just kind of draw a shape, and as you draw a shape, it starts making an enclosed area. And so when you let off the button, whatever's inside that closed area gets selected and again this is just in case you want to like if you need to select some really weird irregular area see that uh, and the main reason i want to go over all these is just in case you get in a point to where the select box really isn't working for you uh, to give you kind of some extra options to kind of fine tune things okay and so before moving on from selection I wanted to go over a few keyboard shortcuts involving selection, which you can use in combination with the different select tools, which will make your life a whole lot easier. And so the first of these is the alt left click. And so if I alt and left click, like on one of these lines, uh, you notice that uh, it selects an entire row. If I alt left click this face, it selects an entire loop around here. And so uh, I refer to this as the loop select, and I'll go to edges so you can see. So it will always select or try to select an entire loop on your mesh. And typically it tries to select in the same direction as the edge you click. So you notice here this edge is horizontal. And so it selects all the horizontal edges it can find all the way around. And this edge is vertical. And if I click that, it'll select all the way up to the poles. And so the reason it doesn't go all the way across is it reaches this point and then it has more than one direction it can move. And so it doesn't really know how to proceed. And so it just stops. And so, uh, you know, this right here, see how it selects the entire loop as well as this example of, oh, look at that. It just reaches the poles and stops. And I mean, you can force this if you want, but now you get a click multiple times and I'll show you how to do this other trick in a sec. But, uh, the point I kind of want to drive home here is a lot of what we do in Blender is to keep our meshes nice and pretty to work with. And so this is a big reason that I kind of harp on make sure that, you know, you use quads, not tries, and make sure to kind of a lot of the tips and tricks I'll give you are really to make sure that you keep your mesh as clean as possible so that you can do some of these selection tips to make your life easier and to make your uh, development faster. So the next thing I want to talk about is control left click. And what that does, this is kind of like a path select. So it, like if I click this down here, you notice it selects this weird thing. And so what it does is it tries to find the shortest path between what's currently selected and where you click. So see, and it does that. And it doesn't always do, like if I do here, it may go, okay, so it did fine. Again, this kind of, it's dependent on how pretty your mesh is. So the more uniform your mesh is, uh, the easier it is to kind of predict what path it's going to take. And then the more chaotic your mesh is, the harder it's going to be. So once again, like see there, uh, it's not necessarily going to go to the middle and go up here. Like it clicked that. It went up to the top row the first chance it got. So again, uh, I don't use this too much, or when I do use it, I kind of try to pick paths that are fairly small, uh, just so I know what behavior that it'll actually have. I just want to make you aware that this exists because it does become really useful later on. Scrolling down, and then uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the shift click. And uh, the shift left click adds to selections. So this is honestly 
one of the most useful little selection modifiers I'm going to show you. So let's say I have that face selected here and I want to select this face way down here, but I don't want to select any faces between them. Just hold down shift and click. And the beautiful thing is, is it works with uh, any of the other modifiers. So for instance, uh, let me go back to edges and just select this and let me do a control. And let's say I wanted to keep going up here. I can hold down shift and control and look at that. Or uh, like, let's say this is a really common one we'll do. Uh, sorry, hit the wrong button. Uh, do an alt left click. And then if we do a shift alt left click, uh, you notice we selected both loops, but we didn't select any of the edges in between. And uh, it's not really, again, we're just getting into edit mode, so it may not uh, be apparent yet how important the ability to do that is. Like if I switch to faces, I could select everything, but there may be some cases where you don't want those vertical edges between your loops selected. So this is actually a super powerful thing. Okay, and so the next shortcut I want to talk about is A. And so A, if you have anything selected, deselects it, and if you have nothing selected, it selects everything. And so this is really useful, especially like if you accidentally click off the model uh, and you're wanting to do an operation that affects the entire object, just hit A and now you've got everything selected again. And the next one is L. And since we only have one object, uh, it may not really be apparent on what this is doing. And so I'm gonna go ahead and do a uh, loop select on this middle loop and I'm going to delete. And one thing I want to bring up real quick since we're in the delete menu is you notice unlike the object mode, when we hit delete it just brought up one thing. But here it brings up a list of different things to delete. And so don't worry about any of these options right here for now. The ones I want to focus on are vertices, edges, and faces. And so let me back up for a moment. Let me just select one face because this really kind of drives home the difference. So if I delete vertices, uh, oh wow, it deleted a lot. And the reason is, is it deleted every single one of those vertices and then it deleted every edge and face that one of those vertices touched. So it's working on the point level. Now if I put it back and then use X again and we choose edges this time, and that makes a cross. And the reason is, is it deleted all four edges and then it deleted all the faces that those edges make up. And then Z, and then finally if we hit faces, it only deletes that one face and it's because we're working at a face level and so it leaves the edges and points alone. So very, very important uh, to know the difference between all three and kind of the behavior uh, for what we were going to do a second ago. So let me switch back into three and do my uh, loop select. Uh, I'm just wanting to delete faces. So there we go. Now we have not a sphere anymore. We have two domes. So now if I hit L, Aha, uh -huh, you notice the top got selected, but the bottom didn't. And you can just tap L again, and it adds the selection, so you don't have to hit Shift. Uh, and what this is, this is like a region select, and so for right now, we're not going to do too much with this, and I'm putting my loop back. But as we start working with more complex meshes that are made of separate pieces, and especially once we get into UV editing, this option will be a lot more useful. And so the last couple of options I want to talk about are actually on the numpad. And uh, these are going to end up being also used quite a bit in these lessons. So let me go ahead and go into vertex mode to show you how this works. So I'm going to select just that top polar point. And so if I hit control numpad plus, it expands out the selection. And if I hit control numpad minus, it subtracts from the selection. And so uh, this is actually just adding and subtracting to what around whatever you have selected. So if I had like this face and hit plus, you'll see it grabs a full loop around what I have selected. And same with thing with minus, it subtracts out a full loop. And so this is especially useful when you're trying to fine tune your selection or to kind of, uh, if you're trying to select part of a mesh where part of the mesh is hidden, then you can select one of the visible points and parts of the mesh and just do control plus a few times until you get the hidden part as well. So uh, those two operations are extremely useful and we'll be using those quite a bit. 
Okay, and so that was a lot, but uh, we're finally ready to move on to the next tool, which is the cursor. And so for right now, uh, we haven't really done much with the cursor. And for those of you that are confused or to avoid confusion, when I say cursor, I'm not talking about my little mouse thingy. I'm talking about the candy cane wheel at the center of the world, uh, or which has been at the center of the world until now. And so you can actually move this thing, and that's what the cursor tool is used for. And so uh, you're probably wondering, okay, well, cool, I moved it, but, you know, it doesn't really seem to do anything, so what does that do for me? And there are some operations that actually heavily depend on cursor position, especially in edit mode, and so this becomes kind of a vital thing. And so if your cursor is in the wrong position, it can really screw up what you're trying to do. And so in addition to this little cursor tool, there's also a menu which you can use to kind of move things around and to move the cursor around, and that is Shift and S. And you'll notice it looks a lot like the wireframe menu, and don't worry about all these options. We will go to them as we need them. The main one you need to know for now is this cursor to world origin. So if I click that, uh, you'll notice it moves it right back around that green dot. And so uh, really important to note right now, so that green dot is called the world origin. And if you remember all the way back to your algebra class, or if you haven't had it yet, so uh, algebra, a lot of it is about graphs. And so the origin is the point in which all of your axes, which are these three colored lines, meet. And so that just moves the cursor back to the point where all the axes meet. And some operations use this point where the axes meet, and some use the cursor. So uh, for the operations that use a cursor, this tool is really important, as is the Shift S menu, so make sure uh, whatever notes you're taking, record both of those as those become much, much more important as we move deeper into our lessons. Okay, and so the next tool is, uh, or the next three tools are just kind of here to mimic uh, the big three operations that I talked about in the last lesson. So this first one mimics the move operation. And instead of using a keyboard shortcut, it has this little gizmo you can use. And I'll hit escape. And what's really cool is if you hit one of these, you notice it kind of does the clamp by default. So you don't have to do G and then Z or G and Y. And these two little things, this even does your plane select. So again, if you need to do a lot of operations in sequence, uh, this might be useful, but honestly, I just stick with the keyboard shortcuts and the same thing with rotate You can see I'm rotating on the x-axis there uh, And then if you hit the white ones, it lets you do all three same thing with the move like this little white thing in the center That's just a free move And then same thing with scale so this scales uh, I, oop, I'm still on rotate uh, so same thing with scale. So if I hit the Z, scaling Z, now scaling Y, scaling X, and then scaling everything. And so uh, one more thing I want to note, and you guys have probably picked up on this already because uh, you guys are smart, but uh, in edit mode, unlike object mode, so in object when we perform these operations, there's really only one choice, which is act on the whole object. But in edit mode, you know, we have different choices. You can either be acting on points or lines or faces. And so whatever mode you're in, so one, two, or three, that determines what you're moving around. So like if I have a point selected, uh, it's hard to see, but it's moving. Or scaling, I mean, excuse me. Let me go to move, that's better. So yeah, you see I'm just moving that one point and kind of the rest of the geometry that's attached to it moves with it, but I'm not actually moving that other stuff and so that's why it's creating this sharp peak. But if I switch to edges, now you'll notice both parts of this, like the edge is moving and all the geometry attached to the edge is moving. Uh, but again, it's really just this edge we're working with and then as you probably guessed by now, uh, same thing with faces. Okay, and so the next one I want to talk about is the transform, and this is kind of like all of the big three combined. So these outer handles, these move things, and same thing with this. 
and these inner circles rotate things and then the inner inner circles you scale things and then the white circles like that's a move and then you've got the rotate and I don't see one for scale uh, so maybe we don't have one or maybe you just push this in here. I don't know. I don't see one for scale. So it looks like just a free move and free rotate. And then scale, you may be stuck on the axes. Uh, if I'm wrong, please, someone let me know in the comments. Okay, and so I'm going to go back to box select. Uh, one of the last things I want to talk about uh, before I give us a break here is something called proportional editing. And this is an extremely powerful tool. So as you've noticed thus far, when I've grabbed things, like I just said, uh, you manipulate what you've grabbed but the rest of the mesh I mean it kind of moves around but you notice like the edges outside the immediate edges they don't really move and so what proportional editing does is it changes that and to turn that on uh, you come up here and this little target button you click it and so if it's blue it's on and if it's gray it's off and so with proportional editing on now if I grab this oh look at that you're actually changing the whole mesh and so just like with the uh, with the circle select if I scroll the mouse wheel in and out you can actually change how much you're affecting and so especially when you're trying to fine-tune a mesh or kind of trying to model especially once we get into the sections where we're modeling off reference images and things this is enormously powerful uh, because it gives you a lot of control over creating shapes that look really organic and look really natural. Like uh, if I turn it off for a sec and then do a grab again. I mean, yeah, that may look cool, but it, it definitely doesn't look natural. Uh, and I mean natural relative, right? But yeah, like that, you see it actually makes a much more... Uh, even keeled shape and I mean yeah you still have this flat face to get around that uh, you would just increase the number of rings and segments like we did in the object mode video so this is where having a lot of geometry uh, really makes a big difference because the more geometry you have the smoother uh, this proportional editing is going to uh, oh, align things and so uh, the little down arrow next to it so you have different shapes that you can do with the proportional editing like sphere I mean this one I feel like is pretty self-explanatory so this makes more of a circle shape like you can see it's much more flattened out on top than the smooth was and uh, you can't really see a lot of these with the size of these cells I have and so I'm not going to go into them the primary one we're going to be using is smooth and we may get crazy and do constant I feel like I've given you guys a lot already, so for now, just know that proportional editing exists and that it's a super powerful tool. And uh, we'll talk about some of these other proportional editing options as we get into the exercises and as we get into uh, later lessons. Wow, <sighs> man, I feel like we just covered a lot. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put kind of a small break in the video here, so consider this the end of part one of the video. And so the rest of the video will be part two. And so right here, feel free to pause the video or stop or rewatch or, you know, really make sure you have what we just talked about down flush before moving on because uh, I'm going to dump a lot more on you guys. This is kind of a longer video and I'm sorry about that. There's just a lot to cover. And so definitely take the time to make sure you understand and are comfortable with what we just talked about. And then once you are, go ahead and hit play on the video and continue on. Okay, and so in the first part of our video, we left off with transform. Now, below transform, you'll notice uh, these three options, which probably don't exist on your Blender options, and don't worry about those. These are from a plugin, and I may do a supplemental lesson later on, but we're not gonna really cover these in the main lesson plan. So the next thing I want to talk about is annotate and the annotate tool is kind of like a pen. And so it lets you actually write stuff in the world. So see, look at that. I can scribble. And if you rotate, you can see it's actually in 3D space, but it's not necessarily where I wrote. So I was 
kind of trying to write on the sphere, but instead it's it's more of right here. And that's because by default, the annotate tool is aligned with the cursor position. And so you can kind of think of it like we have a piece of paper right here at the origin aligned with the cursor. And so the piece of paper is always aligned with our camera. And so we're go going to always draw in line with our cursor position uh, facing the camera. And so like, see if I do this. Yeah, you see it, it's down there at the cursor level. And so uh, I'm going to show you how you can kind of change some of these things in a sec. Uh, first, also note that uh, this is kind of like selection. So if you left click and hold, there's other options. So you've got lines and those work as you might expect. You've got polygons and these work like polygons in a paint program. So, so you can build out a shape. And the last one's the really important one and it is the eraser. And so the eraser does just that. It lets you delete and you'll notice the lines, it deletes the whole thing, but the other stuff, it kind of just deletes little by little. Uh, now, lucky for us, and to make sure we actually get all this crap, if you left click and then scroll, just like circle select, you can increase the radius of your tool. And so there we go, now I've gotten rid of it. So there are a couple of other things I want to talk about with this. Like for instance, uh, you know, let's say I wanted to actually draw on the object. I mean, it's really cool that I can put notes and things, but you know, I may not always want to be at these three axes. Well, if you remember on, uh, we have that shift S menu, which lets us change the cursor position. Let's see if we can do something with that. So, let me go ahead and move into edge selection and let's go up to the select tool for a minute and select that. Okay. And actually let's do points because points are even better. So we'll select this point right here and do shift S. And instead of cursor to world origin, we'll move the cursor to selected. Ah, now our cursor is right on that point. So it's on the sphere. So now let's draw. And yeah, that's a little better. I mean, it's on the sphere, but you can see it's still kind of going off like it's not being clamped to the sphere. So, uh, I mean, if you wanted to put a note there and you didn't care if it was flat or not, that may work for you. But if you really wanted to draw on the sphere, like let's say you were making notes uh, for a particular shape or something, or you were kind of sketching out. And by the way, if you have a drawing tablet, uh, this tool becomes infinitely easier to use. But let's say you were trying to sketch out kind of line work on where you wanted to edit things. You know, this doesn't really work for us. And so let me go ahead and erase what I've got and switch back to this. And let's go ahead and use the in menu, which we talked about last time. And uh, you'll notice that if you go to the tool section, oh, now we have some tools. And one of them is placement. And so there's several placement options, and one of them is surface. So if you click surface, Oh, look at that. Now we're actually drawing on the cube. Now, uh, I feel it mandatory uh, to bring up that, you know, while we're drawing on this shape, this is really at its core, mainly for note taking. Uh, this is not to color objects. So all these notes aren't going to be in your final mesh. This is strictly for uh, kind of helping you plan out what you're going to do. And we'll talk about actually coloring meshes and everything later in the lessons. But uh, this can be an extremely useful tool, especially, like I said, if you're trying to work ver with very specific dimensions or something. And uh, you may have already noticed, you can also change the color here. So if you want to vary, like if you don't like the blue color, I like the blue color because when I draw, this is what I use for my rough drafts. Uh, but if you don't like that color, you're absolutely free to change it to any color which you prefer. And so that pretty much sums up the annotation tool. Like I said, very useful for notes. And I've also heard it's really useful for 2D animation. Uh, I'm not really that familiar with Blender's 2D animation tools. And we're primarily going to focus on 3D modeling and animation. But if you're interested in that, I would definitely look up Blender plus 2D animation 
and see what comes up because I've heard that Blender's actually turned into a fairly decent 2D animation program as well. Okay, and so the next tool on our list is the measure tool and again kind of delivers what it promises. So it creates rulers in three space. And you notice it's not really on the cursor position, it's more of where you draw them. It has some options as well. Now, uh, I haven't really gotten any of these to work, so and I don't use this that much. Uh, the only thing I, or the only situation I could really see this coming in handy for is if you were designing something for like a 3D print and needed very specific uh, measurements. This would be really useful for that, but a lot of the stuff I do is a lot more artistic, and so I will be honest with you guys, I don't use this tool very much. Okay, and so the next tool is one we're actually going to be using quite a bit. And so let me go ahead and get that selected uh, to show it to you. The next one is called the Extrude tool. And so, uh, like you'll notice this little plus here, and if we hit the plus, you'll notice it actually raises it. And this does have a keyboard shortcut, so the keyboard shortcut is E. And so uh, one very, very important thing that I want to discuss with you guys regarding this tool, and uh, it gets a lot of people who are new to this program, is Extrude is kind of uh, sneaky. So it's actually doing two operations, not one. It's duplicating uh, whatever you're extruding, like it's duplicating all these points and edges and everything, and it's also performing a grab. And this is where it gets people. So I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut, not the tool. And so if I hit E and see I'm extruding, and then I decide, oh crud, I don't want to do that. And hit escape. Okay, well, uh, I still actually duplicated the geometry. Like there's more geometry here than appears. And so now, uh, you know, this is where it gets really sneaky. I may not notice because... For all intents and purposes, even if we zoom in, it doesn't really look like there's any extra geometry there. But later on, when we try to do some operation on this, all of a sudden you start getting really weird results, or you start trying to render, and you, it all of a sudden just looks really weird, and you're, you start going, oh, what, what the heck is going on here? And so let me show you how to detect this, because this is really uh, a neat trick, and it'll save you a lot of time and headache. So up here, uh, this is the overlay panel, and if you click the down arrow, and you may have to scroll, there's this section called normals, and the one you're going to be looking for is split normals. And so if I turn split normals on, uh, you'll notice a bunch of little lines, and you may, let me go back to it, wherever it went, uh, you may have to increase the size or decrease the size if it's kind of weird. Uh, and you also may have to fix the normals. So there'll be some times whenever your normals are bad. And so to fix the normals, uh, you just highlight everything with A. And then you use Shift N, and that'll fix your normals. And I don't think ours were bad, but I just wanted to mention that it exists because it becomes a lot more important uh, later on. But one thing you may notice, and it's kind of hard to see, so let me deselect. Uh, you'll notice, you see, there's some blue lines here mixed in with the purple. Now, anywhere you see blue lines, that means that you have duplicated geometry, at least for the split normals. And so the way we fix that uh, is we're going to go ahead and highlight everything again. And there's a super, super easy way to fix it. So you want to make sure that you're working with points. So one on the number row, always. Uh, this option doesn't appear if you're working with edges or faces. And then you're just simply going to right click. Uh, you're going to go to Merge Vertices and by Distance. And you should see a number of vertices removed, like 32. And so uh, now, and I'll show you guys in a minute, uh, I'll go ahead and re-break it to show you what it looks like if it's broken. So control, oops, control plus. And if I grab this, and if I turn proportional editing off, you'll see I just have one face again. Now. I'll go ahead and extrude and escape again to break it, just to show you guys what that would have looked like if it was still broken. So you notice now, oh, uh-oh. And what's happened, like I said, and it really becomes apparent if we move in. And like I said, the reason for this is, is because you have duplicated geometry. So uh, one more time, and it's worth going over twice because this is super important. Right-click, 
merge vertices by distance it removed them uh, and so now we're fixed so this uh, this is an extremely important tip and especially until you kind of get the hang of things I would recommend uh, modeling with the normals on at least if you can bear it uh, if they're really getting in your way you can go ahead and turn them off I mean I don't want to make things harder for you but definitely until you get the hang of some of these operations uh, turn split normals on so that you can make sure that you're not accidentally delete or duplicating things and then to turn it off you just click the button again and now uh, no more so uh, one really cool thing that I want to point out uh, and for this it's best if I delete faces so that we have a clean edge and then I'm going to do a loop select to select the edge so like I said uh, extrude is special in the sense that it really does two operations it does a duplicate geometry and a grab so let me extrude well what this means is after you've hit E and you're moving around your uh, the part that you duplicated you can actually change that operation to one of the other big three so for example if I do E and then S now I'm doing a scale instead of a grab uh, and then if I do an R now I'm doing a rotation and you can absolutely clamp to axes while you're doing these like you all the same tips and tricks that work just pressing one of the big three operations by themselves absolutely work in this case and uh, this is another reason I kind of call them the big three operations and so I'm going to escape out of this and I know that's kind of taboo but I'm keeping my edges selected and we're going to fix it and so I'm going to go do a scale again and we're going to scale in and then you can do that again and what I'm doing here uh, we're going to use this little tip a lot because as we start moving into modifiers and getting into some of our uh, other lessons uh, we're going to see that having a lot of geometry you don't want faces that don't have a lot of geometry because they end up looking really weird when you try to render so you always want to give your faces a fair amount of geometry uh, again striking a balance between having enough geometry to where it doesn't look like crap but not having so much that your computer has to render for two days just to print out an image and then once you get this uh, small enough uh, there's a cool little tip where you can just tap the F key and you will close out the face okay and so scrolling down and uh, going to our next option the next thing I want to talk about is inset faces and so let me select a new face because I think we've thoroughly done all we can do to that one uh, and let me go into face mode so I can actually select a face and it makes this little black handle and if we click and drag that uh, you'll see it actually kind of moves the face in so it's very similar to what we just did with pressing E and then S for scale uh, now the two aren't one-to-one -one. Uh, inset tends to uh, move things inward a little differently so uh, neither one is really useless there may be some cases where you want to use inset instead of ENS and vice versa and we'll definitely I'll definitely show you guys a case where inset has an edge over ENS in just a second. Uh, before I do that though, I want to go over the keyboard shortcut for inset which is just I. So if I go back up here to selection and then just hit uh, if I select one of my faces and do I uh, there it goes. Let me move farther away from the origin which by the way if you ever notice some really funky behavior like you're trying to do an operation you're having a lot of trouble controlling it so the further you are away from your selected thing the more control you have so it'll make a more gradual operation the closer you are it's more drastic so if you ever get funky behavior like you just saw me doing uh, just kind of move away from your object a little bit and then try the operation again and now you notice it works just fine for me and uh, it produces pretty much the same results as uh, the tool does. Now, let me show you the tip that I just uh, was talking about where um, I said the inset has an edge over extrude. So let me go ahead and uh, I'm on the wrong selection, but 
Yeah, I'll go ahead. I'll make a nice selection. I won't be sloppy. So I'll select these nine faces. And let's say I wanted to inset each of these faces. So if I try to hit I, and I'll just use the, uh, the keyboard shortcut instead of the tool, uh, just a fair warning, I tend to use keyboard shortcuts more than the tools, just because it's faster, especially if you're doing a lot of operations at once. But if you're more comfortable using the menu options, or if you're finding it easier to kind of digest things by using some menu options and some shortcuts, by all means, uh, do whatever makes you uh, learn things the best. So if I do an inset, uh, you notice that you know, it's treating everything I have selected like one face, and that may not be what you want to do, especially because, you know, if I were to create this inset, it would make some really weird geometry, especially here at the corners. You notice it, they're kind of slanted squares instead of clean squares, and like I said before, you really want to avoid having uh, non-uniform or uh, weirdly shaped geometry. And what I'm really trying to do is I'd like to have each of these squares inset separately. Okay, so to do that, what you can do is while insetting, you can hit I again. And look at that. So now you're actually insetting each square separately. And so this becomes really useful uh, for creating things like meshes. And we'll actually use this tip in one of our uh, exercises just to make sure that you uh, get it down. And so once you've inset these, you can just do X and do faces and see look at that that's pretty cool you have a nice little window frame or like I said if you were trying to make something like uh, headphones you could have that be a mesh and so there's a lot you can do with this this is definitely a very useful tip to know and it's something you can't really get using extrude and scale so definitely keep that in mind okay moving right along uh, the next tool I want to talk about is the bevel and this is another tool we're going to use quite frequently. So if I move this back into view and kind of do this and do edge mode. Okay, so if I go to the bevel tool, you'll notice, aha, so you get a nice little beveled edge. And down here you'll notice you get a menu similar to um, you get whenever you add an object. And a lot of the operations on this uh, toolbar give you these little menus so kind of pay attention to what's there but bevel is one that we use this box quite frequently and that's because you can actually increase the number of segments here so uh, the the reason you would want to do that is the more segments the more rounded your object will look but again uh, as I've kind of drilled the more segments, the more geometry, and the slower you'll render. And then you can also switch this to ed vertices instead of edges. And so depending on whether you're doing vertices or edges, you can get some really cool effects. So uh, there's a lot you can do with bevel. And like I said, we'll use this quite a bit, especially uh, once we start getting into modifiers, and especially as a way to make things uh, look a little more or a little less computer generated. So generally speaking, things in the real world don't have sharp flat edges and so uh, you'd be amazed at what you know just adding a very small bevel I mean to where the lines practically overlap will do to make an object jump from oh this is totally computer generated to oh this actually looks pretty realistic or looks a at least looks a lot better but uh, and then I guess the last thing I need to go over and I only really have one good bevelable edge if that's a word is uh, the keyboard shortcut. So let me go back to uh, this, but it's just Control B. And as you can see, it does the same thing. It brings up the same box down here. Uh, it, they're practically indistinguishable from one another. Like I said, if you prefer using menu options, by all means do it. Uh, if you prefer to use keyboard shortcuts like myself, go ahead. Uh, both work fine. Okay, and so the next tool we're gonna talk about uh, is the loop cut. And this is another tool we're going to use a lot, so make sure to write down some notes on it. Now, just notice my cursor is still off, so I'm going to take just a second to move that back. Uh, I don't think we're really doing anything with the cursor right now, but it makes me nervous not having it where it needs to be. Uh, so the loop cut is this one right here. And uh, you notice when you hover over an edge, 
uh, it brings up this little black line. And so we have a loop cut, and we've also, I've talked about a loop select. And I, it, it's a little confusing, or it will be a little confusing, and I'm sorry about that. But the loop cut, unlike the loop select, which you remember, uh, the loop select always selects edges in the same direction as the one you click. Uh, the loop cut always selects edges perpendicular to the one you try to select. So you notice I've got a ver vertical edge here, and it's selecting horizontally. And if I uh, switch to a horizontal edge, it'll start trying to select vertically. So keep that in mind. Uh, it'll save you a lot of headache later down the road. And so uh, while you have the while you're hovering over and before you click, uh, or I think it's after you click actually. So when I click, uh, you notice it makes a little line, and I can come down here and uh, adjust the segments. Yeah, it was after I clicked, so I'm sorry about the confusion on that. And uh, this also has a keyboard shortcut, which gives you uh, a little more freedom. And I think that may be why I got confused. And so this is a little intuitive. You would think it would be Control-L for loop. No, it is Control-R. Why they picked that, I don't know. Now, when you're using the keyboard shortcut, you can actually kind of combine the number of incrementing the number of cuts and creating a loop. And so uh, when you're using the keyboard shortcut, and this is only with the keyboard shortcut, you can scroll in and out with the mouse wheel and increase the number of cuts. Additionally, using the keyboard shortcut, uh, after you place the loops, it lets you kind of move them around. And so if you like one to place one loop, but you wanted it way up here close to this other one, uh, you could do that. And we're going to use this uh, little trick quite a bit in modeling. And so I'll kind of cover that a little bit more when we actually get to it in the exercises. I feel like I've dumped a lot on you guys already and there's still a little bit to do. So uh, for now, just keep in mind how the loop cut works and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, now the next tool I want you guys to be really careful with, it's the knife tool and it does have a keyboard shortcut of K. And so with the knife tool, uh, whenever you left click, if you let off of it, uh, you'll start drawing a line. And when you let off the line, it'll make uh, it doesn't immediately make a cut, but it kind of marks where the cut's going to be. Now there are a few options with this, like while you're dragging this line around, if you tap C, uh, you can strain it to 45 degree angles, which can be really useful if you want a precise cut. And then the second option is even more useful, and it is Z. And that toggles cutting all the way through the object. And so by default, and you'll see that in a sec when I rotate, uh, the cuts only go through what the camera sees. But if you uh, toggle Z, they'll actually go clean through. And so I'll do one more cut just so you can see with Z on. Uh, once you've made however many cuts you want to make, uh, you just hit enter and they'll actually subdivide the geometry. Now, uh, if I go ahead and pivot around, you'll notice only there's only one cut that actually went all the way through and that's that last one that I turned Z on for. Now, uh, I also want you to notice that uh, it didn't, and let me click off that to deselect everything, the cuts are really messy. Like, they didn't create clean meshes at all, and that's why I say be really, really careful with this tool, because this is kind of counterproductive to everything you're trying to do, or can be at least, if you're not careful. So, because I want to keep a clean mesh, I'm going to go ahead and delete that knife, and then uh, I'll go ahead and do it one more time using the K tool, just to show you guys that... Uh, you know, it essentially works the same way. So when you hit K, it's kind of like selecting the knife tool. It won't immediately start cutting. You still have to left click to start. And uh, you can hit C to constrain it, just like we were talking about, and Z to cut all the way through. And I'll do a little bit nicer of a cut this time. Well, I said that, but my mouse fidgeted or something. Whatever. Uh, yeah, and you see there's my cut. And it should have, yep, it went all the way through. And I'm going to undo that cut because I want a clean mesh. Okay, so for this next tool, uh, this works better with, or at let, least uh, lets me show you things better with clean meshes or with flat meshes. So I'm going to remove 
our sphere and I'm going to add a plane. Just a plane. Four points, four edges. Uh, and that is the poly build tool. So uh, let's talk about there's there's a lot going on here. Like you already see edges selecting. So if you hover over one of the vertices and left click, it kind of acts like the tweet tool. Like you can move vertices around. And so again, if you were, um, like if your goal was to kind of clean up a mesh really quickly, this could really help. Uh, if you hover over an edge, it acts like an extrude. Uh, and if you uh, if you hover over an edge and hold down control, uh, you'll actually make a whole face, like you won't just extrude a line. So let's talk about the difference. So if you just hover over an edge, click and drag, you make a you extrude the line, so you're going to be making a quad. If you kind of hover over a line and shift, you'll make a face. Now, as you can see, it, they don't really like if you try to make it line up with like a corner. It doesn't really do so very well, so like you have to uh, click and then drag the point up. And be very, very careful doing this because, um, you know, this isn't merging the vertices, so these are still separate. Uh, like there's actually, this is what I was talking about before, you actually just have overlapping geometry here. And so this would actually, you're still going to have to do something to try to merge the vertices, like go into one left click and uh doesn't work outside selection mode sorry about that so a merge vertices by distance and if you notice i don't know if you guys can see that but it didn't actually merge anything and that's because the two vertices aren't actually close enough to each other uh to merge and so again uh be very careful and this is really uh the main thing this is really useful for is something called retopology, and we'll get into that a little bit later in the course. For now, just kind of know the poly tool exists. And the one last thing I want to show you with this is if you hold down shift and left click, it removes faces. So this does have some applications or some uses for uh, building out meshes from scratch fairly quickly, but uh, I guess in my opinion, there are better ways to do this. And so uh, I don't end up using this a lot, but if you really like this tool and this is the way you want to go about things, power to you. Okay, and so straight from object mode, I'm just going to add a new mesh. And we are going to add another plane. Because this next tool I want to talk about, the spin, uh, kind of needs... It, it works better if there are flat things. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to select all. And we are going to rotate around the x-axis 90 degrees. And then we're going to grab and move up one on the z-axis, just so that it, uh, just so that the bottom of the plane is right at the origin. Now we're going to use Control R. Oops, excuse me. Control R to make a loop cut, and then just hit Escape so that it's at the center, and uh, Shift to faces, and then delete my face. So now we have a plane that's centered about the origin. So now I'm going to go to the spin tool and select this. Go to the spin tool. And now if I rotate, you notice it actually uh it actually spins this around. And so the let's say you wanted to make this make sure that you revolved a three a full 360 degrees. So you can hold down control and it does an incremented uh revolution. So it gives you a little more control over things. And, Oh, I'm sorry, my mouse is not wanting to cooperate with me. Okay, there we go. Okay, so as you can see, uh, you can line it up fairly nice. And if you want to be really sure, uh, you notice this is a box similar to bevel and similar to when you add objects. And uh, just make sure that angle says 360 degrees. You can also increase the number of steps. And that increasing the number of steps, the more steps your object has, the smoother or more circular the outside will look but again uh, you know and I know I'm starting to sound like a broken record at this point but the more revolu or more steps you have the more geometry you have and the longer it's going to take to render uh, also I want to point out something really quick so if we kind of try to go inside the object you notice it looks really weird 
Now, that's because whenever you revolve something like this, it doesn't do anything to ensure that the internal geometry, like it revolves everything. So all the edges and faces inside are also revolved. So uh, whenever you're revolving like this, uh, there are a couple things you want to do. So let me select edge mode and I'm going to delete edges. Make sure that's selected. What has gone? Ah, it's because I didn't have selection. I'm sorry about that. So select that. Deleting edges. Something has gone terribly wrong with my object. Uh, okay. So let's just go ahead. There we go. So we should be good to go. There we go. So now I've got a kind of shell or frame and this is what you want anytime you are dealing with the spin tool uh, you never want to spin a solid object like I said you just end up with a lot of really uh, kind of redundant geometry and so now uh, I'm just gonna spin it a little bit and this time I will just set this at 360 degrees and you notice it spins right to it and when we go inside if I can kinda move this back towards the center Ah, huh, that is much better. You notice uh, there are no edges or lines or anything in here this time. It, it actually looks hollow. But we're not quite done yet. So this looks solid and everything, but it's not actually solid. So just because we revolved the object, it didn't close it out for us. So to fix this, uh, we're going to select everything. And uh, we're going to go to vertex mode. Right click. And we're going to do our merge vertices by distance. Now, if you can actually read that, it said it removed 54 vertices. Now, our frame only had four vertices, so if all four were overlapping, it should have only removed four. Huh. So what's going on? Well, if you remember when you revolve, it copies all the geometry. So every single point, since we were at the origin, uh, every single point was being duplicated. So they all stacked up here at the origin. And so uh, you may you know, ask yourself, okay, well, how do I make it not at the origin? Like, what if I wanted to revolve away from the origin? Well, there are a couple of ways to do that. So uh, this is one of those tools that's relying on the cursor. So the spin will always spin around the cursor. So like if I do a spin again, you notice it's right there at the, the cursor position. So... Uh, you can either move the cursor, or another way to do it is just after you spin, if you use these little handles to kind of move things out, uh, you notice that we actually have a wider, uh, we actually have a hole in the center now. And so if I now change this to 360, now we have a this is a much different effect than we had before and like I said uh, I just want to show you both ways to do this so uh, let me go up here to the cursor tool so yeah if I move the cursor off here and yeah see look at that beautiful uh, but you notice the inside is hollow so if uh, you're not right at the origin you may want to leave that edge on the inside uh, you would still want to delete the face though so kind of go back and just for examples purposes and select everything so if I were to do this I mean yeah now it looks fine like you've got your inside but if I go inside uh, you notice things are looking funky again and that's because uh, it duplicated that geometry so again uh, take that back I don't think it duplicated geometry that time you will still ha still have an inside face which is where you started but I don't think in that situation it actually duplicates it I think things only get crazy whenever you're around the origin so uh, I apologize for misspeaking on that okay and so for the next few tools uh, I'm going to remove my plane and we're going to add a cube back. But we need to do something with this cube because this doesn't really have enough geometry uh, for what I want to do. And this also gives me a chance to show you guys another cool little uh, trick, which is subdivide.
So if you right click, you notice there's this option that says subdivide. And if you do that, uh, you notice it immediately uh, splits our cube into four. And so here it also has a little properties box in the lower left, just like bevel and add and a bunch of the other tools we've been using. So if you increase the number of cuts, you actually get a lot more squares. And so this is what I want because the more geometry uh, you have in your object, the better that it's a you're able to see what some of these modifiers are doing. And so actually I'll move this up quite a bit. Uh, again, this is just for uh, example sake. You really want to be careful putting this much geometry in, into your objects or you always want to consider how much geometry you're putting into your object rather you never want to just put geometry into it for the sake of it uh, and that'll become more apparent why when we start talking about modifiers but just uh, for now this should work so the next one I want to talk about is smooth and so this kind of uh, it's almost like bevel but only on the edges a better way to kind of think about it at least if you go in the inward direction if you go in the outward it kind of makes these weird ridges and actually I'm doing that wrong so uh, oops. Uh, one thing I want to notice is uh, you can either drag it a bunch of times but the problem is, is you may even have been a case where you can't control Z through all of them but you can go ahead and just repeat and keep repeating and you see this would be like if I did that seven times and so if you go this way it kind of it's almost like it crystallizes or something or if you go uh, if I undo and go the other way it's almost like the object was eroded or weathered so like if you had like a rock or something or you made a statue and you wanted to give it like a weathered look uh, this could be a really good uh, way to do that so that is the smooth tool uh, the next one I want to go over is the edge slide and so uh, edge slide is really useful it's kind of like a grab but it keeps things clamped to the mesh and so there's a keyboard shortcut that kind of works like this I say kind of because it's not really one-to-one -one and it's uh, shift V so uh, you see it's not one-to-one -one because you unlike uh, the edge slide where you're kind of clamped uh, shift V lets you kind of move around a little bit and uh, you can hold down alt and it will clamp it to a particular axis, uh, but and see in that case it kind of acts similar to what we just had, but it's still a lot harder to get it to actually clamp to the axis you intend. And so, uh, if you're really just wanting a simple move along in axis, I suggest that one. But uh, there is a little bit of additional power with the Shift V method, which is. Uh, that edge slide really just works for edges uh, and the shift V you can actually use that with vertices so if I do shift V and then hold down alt notice I'm actually moving the vertex around uh, and it also works with um, I believe it works with faces but faces it gets a little yeah it works with faces and so there are some cases where we'll use this especially like if you get in a case where you have like uh, you have a row and your faces aren't really aligned you can use shift V massage your mesh back into being a little more uniform and we will use that in a couple of our lessons so definitely no shift V exists and also no edge slide because like I said uh, you, know, you see it, it it does work with faces but it has kind of some different behavior uh, main takeaway know it exists and know you can work with it but uh, yeah, I don't use this very often. I just prefer to use the keyboard shortcut. Okay, and so the next couple of tools are kind of fun. So the first is shrink and fatten. And uh, this is kind of like inflate and deflate. So if you shrink, uh, there's nothing to really stop the geometry from overlapping. And so you can get some really cool results just by playing around with this. And if you go to fatten, it's almost like you're inflating it. So it's kind of like a scale, but it doesn't do it uniform. You end up with these sections to where it almost looks like you blew up the object like a balloon. Uh, so, again, I don't use these too much. Uh, we will use them in a couple of the exercises just because I want you guys to know they're there and use them. But 
Uh, don't feel obligated to learn all these. I know this is a lot to take in. Uh, this is a really long video, and this is going to be one of our longer videos, so I do apologize for that. And then if you hold left-click on it, uh, you get the second option, which is push-pull. And uh, this is, it's similar to shrink and fatten. Like, this looks more like an implosion. I mean, again, if you go past the origin, you can get some really cool results. Like, uh, if you did this with the right object, I could see you kind of being able to get, like, a tree, like, leaves kind of thing, or like a cartoonist-style tree branch. Uh, and if you extrude it a little bit, I could see you, that almost kind of looks like a TV monitor or something. So you could do some really cool things with this one as well. Like I said, I don't do much with that. Uh, the next tool is the shear, and this kind of works similar to the tools in uh, paint programs. So you end up pulling uh, the opposite faces of object opposite directions or opposing faces of object opposite directions. So this one's shearing the top and the bottom in different directions. But if I pick one of these side ones, see now it's the front and back. And uh, if I click this one, now it's the sides. So again, this is something I don't really use too much. But like if you're wanting to make like the thrusters for a starship, like so you could shear that a little bit and uh, now that's a much more interesting shape than just having them point straight back. Uh, same thing if you were wanting to make like a futuristic car, you might want to shear some of the parts to kind of give it more of a, you know, space age look. And then the last tool I want to talk about, and I know I've been getting, going through these kind of fast, but uh, I don't want the video to be too long and I also don't want to dump too much on you guys at once and I already feel like I've uh, sufficiently done that. But the last tool I want to talk about is Rip Region. And then there's uh, also a Rip Edge. But both of these are, the Rip Edge is just kind of more of a limited uh, Rip Region, which uh, attempts to uh, pull an edge or point or whatever you have selected away from the rest, rest of the mesh. So it creates a hole. And it does have some limitations. It really... Like if uh, what you're trying to rip away would rip the object completely out of the mesh, uh, like, ah, uh, there you saw it. See, it doesn't like me doing that. It says you can't rip the selected face, and that's because uh, the edges I have are connected in such a way that if I tried to rip it out, I would just create a flat hole. So if you want to remove a particular face, you're better off just doing delete faces. Uh, but, for instance, like if you had a handle or something you wanted to connect to the object, uh, like you could do one, go into vertex mode and you hit this and then you just pull this away and then you pull this, it'll let me select, there it goes, pull this away, uh, and see it doesn't like me doing that. So there are some limitations uh, at this point though, I mean once you get, uh, and you have to also watch out because you can select the stuff inside, once you get it kind of ripped apart to that, you really can just go back into select mode and kind of clean it up from there but uh, yeah like I said if you were trying to attach a handle or something to your object uh, this might be useful for making like a hole to attach the handle and I mean there are other ways to do this this isn't the only other way and uh, I don't use this tool very often for that reason just because I kind of have my own ways that I do things but I don't want to pigeonhole you guys so uh, if this tool looks really useful to you or you want to play around with it, please feel free to do so. In fact, I encourage you guys to play around with everything, uh, both through the exercises and on your own. There's no substitute for practice, and the more you play around with this stuff, uh, the faster you're going to pick it up. Oh, uh, one tool I did forget to talk about, and it's kind of hidden, so I apologize. Uh, and let me undo all my rips here. Okay, so now we're back. Uh, so I'm going to highlight everything for this one on the smooth. Uh, oh, there are a couple of things I forgot. So under smooth, there's also a randomize. And that uh, does just that. So it moves all the edges in different directions. And so if you barely do it, you get kind of a faceted look. If you do it a lot, you get almost like a crinkled paper look. And again, uh, I don't use this very often, but feel free to play around because you may find a use for that. And uh, under Shear, uh, this is the one that I was thinking of. There's an option called Two Sphere. 
And uh, again, it kind of delivers what it promises. So you just left click and hold and drag. And the more you drag, the more it turns into a sphere. And so if you wanted a sphere with all qu uh, quads, no triangles, that is certainly one way to do it. Uh, and then, uh, you know, there's, you don't have to, you can get any iteration in between. So if you wanted something to kind of look like it was ball shaped, uh, this could be a really useful way to do this. And also combining some of these, or combining multiple of these operations would give you some really, really interesting results. So once again, uh, please do play with all these different things. And the more you play with them, the better you'll be. Okay, Whew. we made it. Man, that was a lot. And I do apologize for the long video, and I know this is a huge amount of information to take in. Uh, I definitely encourage you to pause, rewind, rewatch, do whatever you need to do to understand this stuff. Uh, and I'm also going to be posting a few exercises to go along with this lesson, and uh, I will kind of try to build off these exercises. So the exercises you do for this lesson will come up again in later lessons is kind of revisited to where you can kind of, okay, I know you made this in this previous lesson, but here's adding on to that. And so I'm hoping that by doing things that way, that it'll help you guys really get some practice with uh, not only modeling, but some of the other things we're going to talk about as well. Uh, I will be uploading some exercises pretty quick, so look forward to those. Uh, as always, I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and see you next time.